In this video, I'm going to be talking about this very interesting piece of LED technology that I developed a few years back and the strange and sad saga that goes along with it. Anyone who's ever developed a great product or piece of technology understands what I call the inventor's paradox. That's the strange balance between the emotional grit and passion that it takes to, to see something through and really get it right and that same force leading you astray off the path into the weeds of self-delusion. People have been using LEDs for illuminated signage applications for decades, but it strikes me that there's a huge opportunity to make much more interesting dynamic animated signage. But when you look at how hard it is to do that, you see why people don't bother. It's a nasty mess of difficult labor-intensive wiring, pixel mapping, and a lot of other physical fabrication limitations that just make it impractical for all but the cheesiest mass-produced coffee shop or open signs that you see on eBay. But what if there was a better way? Why can't there be something like a magic light bright toy pixel that you can just poke in somewhere and have it magically become part of some dynamic animated LED spectacular without all the nasty wiring mess and pixel mapping hell that, that you have to go through to create such a thing? This is what inspired me to take the long journey down this road. This light bright analogy got me thinking. What if the video was actually embedded into each pixel? Like each pixel had its own little brain that remembered its whole song that it had to sing. That way you could get away with just powering this thing. Because of course every LED needs power. So you got to have at least two wires. So if we could figure out a way to make the thing work with just two wires, it's sort of like the conceptual bare minimum. So here we go with this idea. The Altralis LED pin system is born. These little two terminal devices can be mounted on any surface that is clad on both sides with a conductive material, like a circuit board. These conductive planes supply power, synchronization, and communication to each LED pin. We're off and running. A driver supplies a square wave AC voltage to terminals A and B. This is the power input. A polarity detector detects each reversal of polarity as an edge. Each edge advances the frame counter which points to the next frame in flash memory. Each frame contains three values for red, green, and blue to illuminate the LEDs at the appropriate brightness level. The input frequency is 15 Hz, which has 30 edges per second. So the output frame rate is 30 frames per second. So how do we keep all of this from getting out of sync? Well, every time the video loop ends, the driver sends a special coded pulse that tells the LED pin to reset the frame pointer back to zero. This ensures that no matter what, all the LED pins remain perfectly synchronized. So how does the driver know when the loop is completed? Well, each time the system is powered on, the driver sends a command to the array of LED pins requesting their number of frames. The LED pins then collectively respond with a binary code that represents the total frame count in the animation. This number of frames is encoded by responding with either a high or low current pulse by turning the LEDs on or not turning them on synchronously with a waveform clock that comes from the driver. The driver then interprets the different current levels and recreates the total frame count from this sequence of pulses. Once it knows the total number of frames in the animation, it just loops them infinitely. Now I know what you're thinking. All of this makes sense, but how the hell do you get the animation into the LED pin in the first place? Well, optically, using a video projector. Now, it was pretty tricky to get this to work right. We had to add a calibration process at the beginning of the programming sequence. This calibration process shines an alternating light and dark pattern onto all the LED pins. This enables the firmware to measure the light level and determine what the bit slice level for a 1 or a 0 should be, depending on the illumination that the LED pins see. 
This compensates for some ambient light and the widely varying range of illumination that you can get out of these video projectors. If you use an integrated piece of software to do both the pixel layout physically and create the animation, there is information about where every pixel is and what the brightness level is at every frame. So based on that, you can create a piece of software that generates a video file that encodes each frame of animation as a series of light and dark pulses that are spatially mapped to correspond with each pixel in the array. A small area of the screen is reserved for an optical reference pulse, which is picked up by an additional sensor. This little sensor drives the driver and tells it to clock the LED pins synchronously with the whole thing. As the LED pins receive data, they write this data into their flash memory for permanent storage and playback. Now using a standard video projector intended to show movies for this is painfully slow, but it does work. In the final version, we would probably end up using a DLP engine with a dedicated piece of hardware and file format that would make this process super fast and efficient. The only practical way to make a proof of concept prototype was by using a microcontroller. The first step was finding an MCU with a shit ton of flash memory that can self-write and erase. The PIC16F1455 fit the bill nicely, providing about two and a half minutes of video storage at 30 frames per second, which is plenty considering nobody is going to stare at a sign for more than two and a half minutes, right? The initial design was based around plain vanilla RGB signage LEDs, but we quickly migrated to addressable LEDs with their own internal driver to minimize the parts count. I built several hand-wired breadboard prototypes to facilitate writing and testing the code, along with the H-Bridge driver which supplies the LED pins with AC power while synchronizing and controlling the playback. Once we had the basic system blocks working, it was time to build a demo system reducing the size of the pin down to the smallest unit that could reasonably be made using off-the-shelf parts. We managed to boil the seven components down to a tiny round 11 millimeter PC board by placing parts on both sides. This board fits into a simple 12 millimeter brass housing that could easily be made on a CNC lathe. The tiny PC boards were fabricated as an array with breakaway connections, so the MCU could be programmed and the whole thing tested while still on the board. Once they were fully checked, we could break them out and assemble them into individual pins. The firmware contains a test mode that activates when the pins are powered with DC. This allows us to test the LEDs and the light sensor of each unit before they are broken out. The finished pins are then screwed into a piece of CNC routed aluminum clad signboard to make a sample sign that would serve to demonstrate the system. For this idea to have a prayer of being economically viable, the whole LED pin would have to be boiled down to one custom piece of silicon, an application-specific integrated circuit in the parlance of the industry. The physical size could be much smaller than the microcontroller-based prototype, allowing much tighter pixel spacing and greater application flexibility, all of which are significant advantages. The non-recurring engineering charge for this ASIC development was quoted at 228,000 US dollars and a year of elapsed time. Cost per unit at 100,000 units, 85 cents. 2 million units, somewhere between 65 cents and 48 cents. Still not cheap enough to make this fly. The cost would probably not work until you got up to many millions of units which is probably possible, but again, it's the chicken or the egg problem. Until you get the price down, you can't sell them, and you can't sell them at the price you got. You know that saying, friends don't let friends drive drunk? Well, I like to say, friends don't let friends try to patent their inventions. And in fact, I tell people never even to use the word inventor. It's pretty toxic in any business environment. Call yourself a product developer instead. It's a much better strategy. 
Now, my business partners in this project insisted that we try to at least apply for a provisional patent. The whole idea made me cringe, but hey, I had to go along with my business partners. Now, I'm no stranger to this patent game. I got my name on about 15 of them, and I have one thing to say. Don't do it. It's not a good idea. All the clients and people that I've worked with who've wasted their time and money on patents, zero have has seen any real return from it. It's a rigged game for large corporations and lawyers. Don't do it. Just say no. The upside, though, is that I do have these great illustrations that I can use to make this video. That's the real payoff here. As interesting and amazing as this piece of technology is, the whole project ended up being a total waste of time for me. As the business obstacles mounted, I found myself doubling down on technological ideas, thinking that if I just made love to this thing enough, somehow all those problems would disappear and it would actually start to work. There are just way too many things that needed to be solved, resolved, and beaten down to make this all fly. So it's been several years since I've actually even looked at this thing. It was just sitting in my uh, storage room gathering dust. And now taking it out and playing with it again really um, inspires me. It's like, that's pretty cool. And even though the whole project ended up being like a total economic loss and you could really say like a complete waste of time, I would do it again in a heartbeat. I love doing stuff like this. I love following my crazy passion down the rabbit hole and trying to do something new and amazing just because. Expecting everything to pay off in terms of money and power and prestige is, is a fool's errand that really is not the way to live. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like and subscribe.